Hi, I'm Todd Marler, Senior Director of Operations for Greystar UK and Ireland. Thank you so much for joining me on what will be an experiential tour of Greenford Quay, one of Greystar's premier assets in the London area. You'll get to hear a little bit about the history of the asset, about the estate, some of the operational um, perspectives, as well as getting to hear more about the design itself. I hope you enjoy this tour and I look forward to answering questions at the end of the video. My name is Gary McCluskey and I'm the Managing Director for Global Design at Greystar. Today I'm going to talk about Green for Key and how we took a site that was derelict all the way through the design process with five different architects negotiating the planning with Ealing and the GLA and delivering the first building, which is Tillemans, using modular off-site construction. My name is Neil Shah. I'm Design Director at Greystar. I'm going to be talking about uh, Tillemans uh, at Greenford Quay uh, and in particular uh, how we have designed the building, the process that we've gone through and some of the challenges that we've encountered along the way. So we first acquired Greenford back in 2016, I think. Um, and at that time, the site was derelict and separated from the surrounding area. Um, and this is a nice area because it's got, you know, it's got lots of um, nice housing um, and uh, very suburban. But the site was right on the canal and uh, it completely isolated the canal from the area. Uh, there were a few connections, but you know, the site basically wrapped around one side of the canal, and you know, part of the canal wall was actually falling down as well. So when we spoke to neighbours and the people who lived here, everyone was really excited about the opportunity of kind of opening up the site again. Um, it was a big kind of empty, um, derelict piece of land that had probably been sitting for about ten years. Uh, so we got the site and we had one architect at the time sort of starting to look at it. And I kind of thought it'd be a really interesting idea if we brought in other architects. I think some people were a bit worried because, you know, they kind of thought, well, that's a, you know, dealing with one architect is bad enough, you know, but uh, bringing in five architects is, uh, is a little bit tricky. And I can say that because I'm an architect, so, you know, um, so dealing with architects, um, we kind of speak the same language, you know, so it's a, it's a little bit easier. Um, I also thought it would be really interesting if we engaged with the community and the local authority at a really early stage and all through the process. Uh, so we ended up setting up a kind of weekly session workshop um, where we worked through some design ideas, we worked through the master plan and, you know, really kind of try to develop a project that you know, was going to transform the area, you know, not just the site, uh, but was going to really bring something to the whole area. Um, so, you know, part of that was sort of building a huge model, sort of 
three meters by a meter of the area and the master plan and working with everyone to try and um, develop something that you know we could all agree on was a you know great sort of master plan project um, that involved sort of you know how do we connect to the canal we've got horse and Den hill right next to us um, you know how can we increase the permeability across the site there are some great cycling routes here um, you know how could we use the canal edge uh, and how could we create a central heart to the project you know that is you know a lot more than just residential but is a mixed use development you know with retail um, leisure activities so you know we incorporated a, a cinema space we incorporated um, canal boat moorings you know for uh, restaurants um, we have put in a lot of retail space and so it's, it was a kind of you know, it wasn't just about modeling the form of the site. It was about thinking, what do we want to have happening here? Um, how do we want it to be used? And how do we want people to be engaged in the site? How can it become bigger than just the boundary or the edge of the site um, and appeal to a wider neighborhood? Uh, so it was an amazing journey and we did it in a, you know, really fast paced time scale. Um, and we had lots of discussions and lots of arguments uh, over some things. Um, but in the end, we kind of developed a scheme where, you know, the, the neighborhood, uh, the local authority, Ealing, um, the consultant team were actually really excited about what we had produced, you know. And I think that was, a, that was an amazing period of time uh, with a massive amount of energy that went into it from everyone. Uh, you know, we had five architects with big teams working on all of the development um, and developing the landscape as well as the buildings, you know, and looking at a new bridge over the canal. You know, so all of those things were really, really sort of um, interesting and fascinating to kind of dig into the detail. My background as an architect was in residential for sale development. You know, I worked on a lot of large-scale projects in London and I understood it very, very well. And you'll find that, you know, as we work in different uh, regions or cities, you know, each city has its own regulatory requirements for housing. Um, but most of those regulatory requirements are actually designed for unmanaged housing, you know. Um, and when you're managing housing developments, it's a completely different thing to unmanaged housing. Um, and unmanaged housing and immobility are the two things that kind of define affordable housing and for sale housing uh, in the market. So when I talk about immobility, when you're renting an apartment, you can change apartment pretty much every six months. You can even change apartment every month if you like within the same building. So there's complete mobility of movement if you're a renter. If you've bought a house, then you know, you're gonna be there for maybe five, 10 years. Or if you're in affordable housing, it, the market is so tight that it's very difficult to move within that market. So one thing that sort of private rental housing does is allow mobility for the people who live there. And professionally managed private rental housing adds another layer of service to that and experience. Now, when we first sort of took the ideas from the US and we brought them back to the UK, I sat down and I looked at the policy guidance that the GLA had set out and there were 11 points where if we wanted to do a really well managed institutional investable product in London, then we would have to break these 12 11, sorry, 11 policy points. And so in the first meeting of the GLA, it was very difficult. I had to highlight all of the policy points that we were going to break. And all of these policy points, remember, are based around for sale housing, unmanaged buildings, you know. And the key message that I had to kind of get across was that those policy points are great. They're great for that type of housing this is something very different. Now, we did about six presentations to the GLA 
um, and in each one, I took each policy point and I pulled it apart and sort of said, look, this is where this policy point comes from. You know, this is why this policy came to be. Um, and this is why it's not really appropriate for what we're trying to do, you know. And so slowly over those kind of six meetings over six months as we were developing the design, you know, the GLA actually, you know, and it wasn't just us, I think, you know, other developers who were looking at multifamily housing were saying the same kind of things. Um, and the GLA sort of started to be supportive of, you know, um, those changes to the policy points. And at the end of that period, they issued uh, new policy guidance for the whole of London, which basically said, when you're considering a professionally managed rental um, housing product in the market, you should actually relax the provisions of these 11 policies, you know. And that, I think, was really amazing, you know, that, you know, all of the work that the architects had done and all the work we did with Ealing and all of the time that we spent with the GLA was actually being transformed into policy and so many people input into that process to get that change. Um, that it was just incredible that you could get this movement of all the developers and everyone in the councils and the GLA, you know, focused on trying to bring something new to the market and it would actually transform policy that had been established for, you know, maybe 25 years. So we'd gone through a design process where it was, you know, a rapid design process with a lot of input from everyone. Um, and what we wanted to do was to deliver it as quickly as possible. So we'd kind of shortened the design process and then we had kind of shortened the construction process by going down this volumetric uh, modular route. And we involved the contractor at a really early stage in the design process um, and started working with them to adapt the building and adapt the design uh, so that it would work in terms of the layouts and the plans and the spaces, but we could also deliver it using a modular system. Uh, and that in itself was a really interesting process uh, because you know all modular systems are slightly different, uh, and the one that we've used is a sort of unique system that uh, you know works really well for residential. Uh, so, so that was a sort of you know um, we started to get into that process in a lot of detail. We started on site, um, and you know the whole program went so rapidly. Uh, and we had very, very few issues, you know, we were digging into the ground, we didn't discover anything unusual. Um, I think the only odd thing that happened was that part of the canal wall collapsed as we were building, um, part of the canal wall that we owned, um, which we'd already identified was a problem, you know, and so, so we rebuilt that whole sort of canal edge and that's where we put the amphitheatre um, and where the bridge was. and. Um, and then we wanted to kind of deliver the public square at the same time as the first building. And, and so that became a really important part of the process as well. Um, and, you know, getting a public square that is active, you know, that people will come to. Um, and we'd looked at, you know, really good references like uh, King's Cross, where, you know, that water fountain at King's Cross is super successful. I mean, it draws so many people from the community to that area. And we thought, you know, if we did a smaller version of that, then, you know, let's see what happens, you know. And I think it's proven out to be a really successful, you know, um, addition to that public space. Um, so we went through the construction process um, and, you know, it, I wouldn't say it was, it, it, it was um, you know, without issues, but it was much, much simpler, much, much faster than what you'd ever do in a traditional uh, construction route. Uh, we had to figure out all the details in advance of the construction process because you're manufacturing these things in the factory before they come to the site, you know. So, so you have to be thinking well in advance of, you know, when it's actually going to be delivered. And they were delivering modules and stacking them up um, next to the building site, ready to be lifted onto the site. So, and it was it was amazing to watch. You know, they were doing sort of I think maybe, God, I think it was maybe three or four. Maybe I've got it wrong. Three or four modules a day. You know, were going in, um, and we designed it in such a way that you know two modules would make a one-bedroom apartment. 
three modules would make a two bedroom apartment um, and two modules would also sort of make a studio apartment but um, you know and so it was all very carefully thought through so that we could deliver it super efficiently um, and then we spent a long time kind of you know thinking about the facade materials and brick is obviously a London material uh, and it's been super successful in other projects using brick and so we felt that you know the whole development should probably reflect the nature of the fact that we're in London um, and so we've used brick extensively but we've played around with the details on the facade on different buildings and we've changed the brick colours and you know so we're getting a lot of variety and having five architects involved means that we get five different kind of personalities spread throughout the scheme um, and that variety I think adds you know a lot of character to um, uh, the whole experience of being here. I suppose the, the way we approach design is everything is resident led you know we think about what it's like to live in the building and occupy the building and we try and encourage people to meet other people you know so you know one of the biggest things I think that um, is important in what we do is that you know we obviously lease out in a norming, normal kind of leasing environment where you're sort of advertising a building and you're sort of saying um, you know come and see the building and you know see if you like it and you know if you like it then stay but a lot of our leasing actually comes from people who live in the building you know their friends come over and they love the building and they're like wow why, why aren't we living here and so you know as a designer as an architect that's a really kind of interesting way to think about how you're designing the building you know it needs to kind of people need to sort of arrive at the building and feel something about the building when they see it you know they have to kind of think well actually yeah I can imagine living in this building even when they're looking from the outside and so you know that's the first point of call when you're sort of thinking about the design and it's partly why we we take this approach of you know we like active ground floors you know so that the streetscape is activated and there are things happening on the street which means that you know when people are coming they can see at the streetscape level that you know there are activities going on both at the street side and on the inside of the building and then the other thing is having rooftop amenity becomes a kind of beacon from the outside when you're looking at the building and you're walking down the street and you look up and you go wow I wonder what's going on up there you know and most people might think wow that's a really cool penthouse apartment but actually you know that's the communal space and so you know that's the sort of key thing is getting this sort of curb appeal for the building um, and making sure that your amenities are in the best part of the building and that you know they're expressed externally as a special place and um, and always being conscious that every time we put a building in a site it's not just the building that is the important thing it's what the building does to the surroundings that's really important um, and how it interacts and and sort of weaves itself into the context which um, you know can be a challenge in some places uh, but it is the, the most important thing when you're thinking about you know designing uh, buildings for Greystar. The interior design of this building was a really interesting um, uh, process because um, essentially every site that we um, uh, plan to develop, um, we always try to dig under the skin to try and find what's the meaningful aspect of that site, what's the local context, what's the history. Um, and you know, this is quite a rich site. I mean, it's got it's got um, um, uh, an industrial sort of heritage aspect to it, but it's also got um, a, a, a canal side history where um, factories used to exist. There used to be a John Lyons uh, a Lyons Tea House um, factory uh, located here, um, and so one of the starting points for the interior design um, uh, for this building was looking at some of those 1930s tea houses um, and fusing that with um, the industrial kind of eclectic heritage of the site and so I think the way that that design then extrapolated within the interior fit out um, has resulted in 
in, 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 in the aesthetic you see, but it also permeates itself through into some of the apartment designs as well. Every time I engage with uh, residents, I'm always intrigued to hear their story about how they're experiencing you know, the apartments. The apartments are designed um, with such rigour. We, we, we guard our apartment design like gold. You know, we, we, we've put a lot of time and a lot of effort designing every aspect of that apartment from junctions to um, maximising storage, maximising daylight, um, maximising space, um, you know, and, um, you know, these things are sacrosanct to us. Um, and so I'm always interested to hear feedback from uh, residents as to, you know, how, uh, what's their experience, uh, you know, using the space, um, touching uh, uh, elements um, and understanding whether or not it's, you know, fit for purpose. I think um, Greystar um, and the Greystar design team um, sort of stand by um, sort of firm principles um, about where we place immunity within a building, how our buildings are planned out, um, where things should be, the adjacencies of uh, immunity spaces uh, next to external spaces. Um, so all of these things are, are very heavily considered. We, we, we stand by the principle of placing amenities in the best part of the buildings. Um, usually those are on the ground floors as a resident enters uh, a building. Uh, we'll have a magnitude of amenities on uh, the podium levels and we'll also have amenity on the rooftop levels. And so the idea is to democratise uh, these spaces uh, for all of our residents to enjoy rather than by placing perhaps penthouses on the top floor essentially. So um, yeah, it's a very important principle we stand by. Um, we also stand by the principle of um, the idea that this is home and so the building has to represent that feeling of coming home at the end of a day. Um, so we try to make our spaces um, open, flexible, connected, but at the same time intimate and you know residents can find pockets of space to perhaps perch from during the day or work from or um, socialise. So um, yeah, some really interesting uh, sort of principles that we stand by. The beauty of our process is the fact that we have a suite of apartment types. We design buildings from the inside out and these building blocks are essentially allowing us to flip procurement from traditional to modular. Um, it allows us to change the mix where we need to change the mix and change the number of apartments within a particular block um, very easily. And so we have a structural grid that all of our apartments are based on and um, that allows us to inherently um, have the, that flexibility. The fact that we've gone modular on this, we've uh, managed to save 26,000 tonnes of CO2 uh, from the off-site manufacturing process. Um, it's resulted in um, uh, uh, less work on site, less pollution. Um, um, and that, what that essentially translates to is some really interesting figures. Um, so it translates to 3,562 zero energy homes being run on an entire 12 months basis, or 7,000 vehicles being taken off the road, um, or 810 million balloons uh, of uh, CO2 gas not being re uh, released into the atmosphere um, uh, or 160,000 trees being planted. What's beneficial from a Greystar perspective is that we're a vertically integrated company uh, where everything is predominantly in-house. We've got um, sales marketing, we've got uh, design, we've got operations um, and we've got development uh, as well as invest investment. So. Looking at it from all of those aspects, you know, we as a design team are sort of sitting somewhere in the middle um, and we, um, you know, we benefit from that sort of adjacency uh, to all parts of those businesses. Um, and there's a constant feedback loop that's happening as a result, um, which um, sort of further hones our product. What I've learnt from the first development here at Greenford Key um, is perhaps there's elements of how the building gets leased up, uh, how certain spaces need to be delivered in the first phase, 
about locating sometimes locating an amenity on the rooftop level means that it might be a challenge actually releasing that amenity with the first apartment so you know sometimes we need to think about you know is the rooftop perhaps you know the best place to, to place the amenity i think from a print the design principle perspective it is but maybe sometimes you know uh, locating it um, uh, uh, lower down a building perhaps onto the shoulders of the, the lower level blocks that might be an opportunity and it's some, something that we're looking at on other blocks now you know each of the blocks following um, Tillemans we've got block four and block eight a lot of the lessons learned from block uh, Tillemans here block five um, uh, we're taking on board um, and um, we've got a feedback loop that we're trying to establish within Greystar with our with our on-site operations team uh, with our construction team um, and even with the sales and marketing team, you know, how can we better the process? How can we get the right things at the right time uh, during the development phase? So I think what underpins uh, all of these strategies is practical, easy, modern ways of living that respond to our residents' needs, um, bearing in mind safety and security. So that kind of is the wrap around um, all of our core principles um, from a design perspective. So how do you operate um, multi-buildings um, or a estate that has multi-assets attached to it? We have experience doing that. Uh, one of the benefits of being part of a global platform, um, we've got over 660,000 apartments um, under our management. So we do have some experience um, managing large um, estates or multiple buildings. It can be a challenge and it's something you have to really think about from the very beginning um, as you're planning out the project. I think it's really important to um, think about the end result and where you want to be operationally um, and how you envision the operations happening at the end when everything has been built. Currently here, we've got one building, um, one block uh, that is fully operational. Another one is in development, um, and then we will have seven uh, multifamily built-to-rent blocks in operations once completed. So the idea is you may have to do some front-loading of payroll. Um, you need to think about what the overall estate you want to look like and how you want that to operate. Um, you know, we chose to hire somebody that would do events, um, not just for an individual block, but to do events for the entire estate. Um, really thinking ahead about what is this going to look like when it's operating in um, full operations with all blocks available. So I think ultimately it's just about really um, planning ahead and being thoughtful about where you want things to be and how you envision that looking so that you put the blocks in place to operate it in that manner. One of the things that we're really proud about um, here at Graystar are our on-site teams. I always say that the, the most important people in the entire organization are those that are working on site. They're the ones that make things happen. And ultimately, at the end of the day, there are a lot of different buildings out there and a lot of different choices for people to choose from when they decide where they're going to live and where they're going to call home. But it's the people on site that I think truly make the difference. So we've got an amazing on site team here at Greenford Keys. Um, we've got a community manager, an assistant manager, um, a group of leasing associates that do direct lets, um, as well as a full facilities management team. Um, and we've got a facilities manager that, that is hands-on, but also um, strategic um, and operational, um, as well as a, a group of facility team members to take care of the ongoing operations. On top of that, we do have an estate, so we will have a state manager as well as a state facilities team to ensure that the estate is being operated equally as well um, as the asset. Great team, really focused on customer service is key, um, focused on doing what's right for our customers um, and our residents. Um, and, and focus in on the experience. So it's all about how do we create the experience. It's great to have amazing amenities, have a beautiful estate, which Greenford Key definitely does have, um, but most important, it's about developing an experience for the people who come here to live or who come to even look um, at, at the property. And that's what the on-site team really specialize in. 
Um, and like I said, I'm really proud of, of the work that they do and, and how well they're able to craft that experience. One of the most important things about operating a asset is making sure that we think about retention. I'm sure everybody thinks about how do we make sure we're retaining our current residents as well as attracting new residents to move in. Um, you know, for us, stabilized is between 95 and 97 percent. And the way you continue to achieve that is making sure that you keep a large percentage of your residents um, renewing and staying with us. So how do we do that? What does that process look like? I mean, for us, it's about, again, that customer experience. Um, and it's about how do we craft that experience and allow people to become part of the greater community. So the experience is about building community and feeling like they are a part of um, this community. They've built relationships with others. They have built friendships. So the way we do that is through uh, crafting great resident events. I mean, it's about making sure that you are thinking about all types of events to meet all different needs. But then we really work with our teams to think about how do our current residents expect to have um, events or expect to have um, interactions with, with the other residents that are um, within the building. And so we come up with events based on who's here. So if we've got a lot of dog owners, we'll do pet events. If we've got people that we know seem to really love wine and cheese and socializing, then we'll do wine and cheese events. Um, so it doesn't have to be one type of event. But one thing I will say is we work hard to make sure that we have a resident calendar put in place um, so that, and we send that out to all of our um, assets across the, the UK so that if this week you don't know what kind of event to do, you have somewhere to pull from. But really what's important is just making sure that you consistently are listening to your customer and understanding what they want and then delivering on those expectations. We survey our residents um, both through third-party surveys and then through an internal survey process that we use to really understand what people want and where are they having frustrations and issues because we can't get it right all the time and we don't expect to get it right all the time. But what I would expect is that our teams are thinking about how do we hear what our customers are saying and come up with solutions to, to help solve some of those problems that they're bringing to our attention. So we really are happy to get resident feedback and then think about how do we approach taking that feedback and turning it into a positive opportunity for us that will improve this community um, for the long term. One thing that's really important to do when you have a new asset or development coming out um, is making sure you're listening to your community. And, and it's important to make sure that from the very beginning you're building relationships with the city council, but you're also building relationships with those who will be living around your building. What we do is we build communities within communities and hopefully we're helping improve the current status of, of where people are living. And so it's about listening to what people's concerns are, it's about addressing those concerns, but then it's about consistently staying in communication and contact with, with the greater community. Also thinking about how do we help support that? Um, are there ways that we can put money into street improvement projects that will benefit both the community here, but also um, our community. Um, Placemaking is a big deal for us, and so one of the things that we are doing is we've got events that we put on, not just for our residents, but for the greater community. And so some examples of that would be we brought in food trucks um, uh, on a regular basis so that everybody that lives around here can come in and enjoy the estate and enjoy um, you know, the canal and enjoy the bridge and enjoy um, the water features and enjoy what we're building here. So. We want to make sure that we're not just thinking about the people who are living here immediately, but also the people that live around us, because ultimately we are a part of Greenford. Um, Greenford Key is meant to be a, an amazing development for people to choose to make their home at, but it's also meant to be an amazing development to help grow um, and build a greater community within Greenford itself. Service to me and for our community and like here at Greenford is about thinking about what level of service you provide at different stages in a resident's life. So we think about the service offering before they even first make contact with us. So making sure our website is easy to use, that they can go on there and get information that they want. That's a service level. Um, then we think about what does the customer experience look like from the moment they walk in. So we've got free coffee stations for people. Um, we want to make sure people feel welcomed and at home. And then when they come to the next step, which is coming to move in, we try to make it simple and easy for them. So how do you facilitate 
you know, setting up utilities, getting your Wi-Fi operational, making sure everything is ready to go the second you move into your home. So we offer that level of service. And then when they're living with us, making sure that, you know, we answer service requests. If something's wrong in your apartment, we want to know about it. And we want to fix it immediately. Um, we're here for you 24 hours. We have 24 hour concierge at the front desk and the team is trained to answer questions in the moment um, to, to assist people um, as they need it. You know, living in a, in a COVID world of today, it shows even more important how we need to have a high level of service for the people who are living in our buildings. So one of the things that we had done is thinking about what is it that our residents really are seeking and wanting. You know, they want to be part of a greater community and they want not just to have virtual events, which we offered. So they had a platform they could go on in, in real time and on demand, they could pick whatever they wanted to learn about. Was it how to write a resume? Was it join a concert? Was it do a yoga class? They had all of that at their fingertips. But it's also about then how do you craft community when you're told to stay away from each other, right? Um, with COVID. And so we did a couple of different things. We sent tea to our residents and said, take pictures of you drinking your tea in your favorite place in your home so that the rest of the community can see why you love living at Greenford Key. Um, and, and we got a great response to that. We sent seeds and said, grow a sunflower, take pictures of your sunflower as it grows in your home and let other people in the community take part in that. It's about thinking about ways of creating and crafting community and in, in interactions in which you really bond with those who are living here at this community as well. You have something in common, you've chosen to live here and we want you to be happy to be part of that community. So to me, that's a service level that we offer. And then finally, if you choose not to live with us in the future, if your life circumstances change, we want to make sure that we help facilitate that move and make it easy for you. And that's service as well. Or if by any chance, you know, we can help facilitate and move you to another Graystar community or even facilitate and move you into a different unit within the building, you know, we want to do that as well. So it's just about listening to the customer and then having a response to what those needs are. I mean, ultimately, brand is, is, is a key part of what we do. Um, and, and then we make sure that we have that brand carried throughout. So, you know, when you go onto our website or when you're walking up to our community, you should recognize, oh yes, that's Greenford Key. When you're living here, you should recognize, oh yes, I live at Greenford Key. And you know that by the way it looks, by the way it feels, um, by the way um, that it makes you feel, right? And so it's about eliciting certain reactions and emotions. And so it's not something that we didn't think about or do intentionally. It's something that we very much thought about from the beginning. Again, when we thought about how do you create this large development, we looked at long-term, what did we want it to be? And then thought about what does that brand look like? And then how do you create brands within that brand? Um, because it is important. It is important in how we sell um, ourselves and how we help people identify with where it is they're going to be calling their home. One important question that I get a lot is around what do our tenants want today? What do residents want today? But then also, how has COVID changed that? And what do we think our residents are gonna want in the future? Does it look different or is it the same? So we spend a lot of time really thinking about those questions as we look ahead into the next blocks at Greenford Key and how do we apply those learnings? So we listen to what our residents are saying now and what are the trends of today? And then how do we think about what that is going to look like in the future? So here are some things that I know for sure. Our residents want not just the square footage of their home, but they want a larger square footage. That's why amenities are so important. They want to be in a place where they have access to a lot of different types of square footages that they can use. Um, so amenity space is really important and well thought out amenity space. Amenity space that's really well um, fitted to the demographic, um, but also to the brand, right? And so, so we work really hard to do that. Um, but what we're also finding is they really care about the finishes of the interior of their home. They want a, um, a quality finished package. They care about what the appliances are. Even sometimes they really care about the brand name of that appliance. They, they care about what their closet space or their wardrobe space looks like. They care about how do their windows open or close? Do they have access to a patio or don't they have access to a patio? They really care about those things. And so we have to think about how do we implement that um, into the next design and how do we hear what our customers are saying and then make sure we're providing that. 
Um, and then the other thing I think that we're hearing a lot about, because people are at home so much, these trends have only been elevated. Um, and, and people want to really make sure that where they live um, is a place that they want to be because they know that they're going to be there a lot, right? Because they're now working from home, they're inside more often. Um, it, it's a very different environment. So one of the other things that we're seeing is that people are willing to pay a little bit more to get that quality finish level, to get that amenity package, and then even more importantly, to get a little bit more square footage in the home in which they live. You know, previously, some of the trends that we had seen in London were driving people to one bedroom. So one bedroom traffic and demand was much higher than the two bed and three bed traffic and demand. And we're seeing that shift actually, which is interesting. And I believe it's definitely because of this COVID environment. People are starting to think about, hmm, should I spend a little bit more of my discretionary income on an extra bedroom and space because I'm gonna be there more? Or do I want that discretionary income to do other things? Well, in this environment, that you know, they don't have that same optionality. But I think that's a trend that's probably gonna continue. I think that people are going to, in the future, demand even higher qualities of services, higher quality of uh, finishes, and I think they definitely are gonna demand a little bit more square footage um, than they have previously been demanding. My name is Lauren. My name is Richard. For work, I'm a clinical research associate. And I'm a gas engineer. At the beginning, when we were deciding to move in together, we weren't too sure where it would be. But when we first walked into Greenfield Key, we were just kind of blown away. I mean, I think for me, it was the tall ceilings and the corridors being so wide. It was just so light and welcoming. It's really modern. Um, the way they've finished certain things is uh, like really top quality so we were kind of blown away the first time we walked in and we thought yeah this is perfect for us. Living by the water oh it's so serene it's and it's just beautiful and it's it's lovely to see the barges come and go. The best thing about having a new puppy oh she's just a new part of the family isn't she? Yeah she is just part of the family now. And everyone loves her and they look after her downstairs. Yeah the, uh, all the workers reception. Yeah, <laughs> and the security they all love her so yeah it's really good. When you walk in there's always a friendly face and there's just such a community feel here. Yeah, the facilities as well that they provide us you know you've got a cinema room you've got a gym uh, that's 24-7. I think it's more having the facilities upstairs, so the social areas, because I have a lot of um, friends who live quite far away, so when they do come and stay, we can make use of those facilities, again with a lot more Prosecco, so it's fabulous. <laughs> It's been wonderful actually, really nice to be out and about in the fresh air and really nice to be out by the canal. So we made full use of the estate and it was really nice to be enjoying the outdoors after lockdown. Get a little bit of outdoors excitement and adventure for the young people and it's lovely to, you know, it's a little community hub that we can come and be involved in. I didn't know about this place, um, so I was really surprised to find how beautifully landscaped it is. It looks like a really nice place to just come and sit, so I think they've done a great job of uh, sort of reimagining the landscape. It's lovely to see the canal being used like this. There were some really nice little flowers that we saw just along our walk um, that added like a burst of colour, so I've sort of added a few little red flowers. It was really interesting to see the, the apartments themselves and it was also good to see the facilities which the people who are going to live here and are indeed living here um, can enjoy. Very impressed with the roof terrace. I was brought up around this area so I knew the Glaxo company and had family work for them and everything. We just was interested really what it was all about and that's what I like. I like to mix, I like to chat and uh, be part of a community. Thank you very much for your time today. Hopefully you've enjoyed getting to hear about our community. Now you're gonna get the opportunity to ask us a few questions live.